This month on In Case You Missed It. With relatively warmer waters, 400 miles of coastline, and abundant food sources, Rhode Island attracts snowbirds from as far as the Arctic coast. In this episode, discover the habitats where, if you're willing to bundle up and explore, winter wildlife can be spotted. Slater Mill in Pawtucket is recognized as the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Discover more about the ingenuity, innovation, and child labor that kept the mill running. Plus, see the machines that revolutionized the face of manufacturing everywhere. And another Rhode Island PBS favorite is back. Ocean State Sessions returns this March. Meet local musicians and hear their original songs. Enjoy the rich and diverse musical culture found right here on our doorstep. All this and much more, in case you missed it. Welcome to In Case You Missed It, where we look back at some of the best local content on Rhode Island PBS, plus give you a sneak peek at exciting new content coming soon to your screen. Here in New England, short, gloomy days and long dark nights tend to keep many people indoors for much of the winter. But as we recently found, there's plenty to see outside. From seals to snowy owls, Rhode Island attracts migratory birds and creatures from as far as the Arctic Circle, as the temperatures there start to plummet. Many bird watchers hope to catch a glimpse of these winged visitors as they pass through the ocean state. Soon after the sun rises over this rocky coastline, bird lovers gather. Have any of you been to Black Point before? Some of you, maybe? Okay. Excited for what winter wildlife they might find. You had a catbird? Yeah, it was, it was a big gray. I didn't see it, but good. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yep. Indeed. Yeah, in, in this shrub back here is a uh, catbird. Every Wednesday morning, the Audubon Society of Rhode Island organizes a bird walk. So I'm gonna leave this low for people. On this day, the group is trekking through the Black Point fishing area in Narragansett off of Ocean Road. So in my scope, if you wanna look, there are some surf scoters. They're looking for birds that flock to Rhode Island during the winter time. Don, they have that orange beak, right? They have an orange beak and they have that white patch on there in and on the back of their head. Including the ever popular harlequin ducks. You typically see the harlequins in uh, close to shore where the waves are breaking. They like the, the stirred up water. These enthusiasts know there's a short window of time to get the best view of these colorful ducks. So there's uh, harlequin ducks. Let's see what else we have. But birders don't have to travel to the coast to spot winter wildlife. Photographer Jason Major likes to venture into the woods along the Patuxet River Trail in Cranston. So the Patuxet River Trail has uh, a few owls, resident owls of its own. Um, I've spotted some barred owls here. They're pretty, uh, pretty easy to spot and very photogenic. Some of those walks have resulted in mesmerizing pictures. He's captured it all from these black scoters in Charlestown to mergansers in Connecticut. He's also photographed a short-eared owl in flight and on the ground, as well as a group of seals he found resting on rocks in Saconet Point. That was a kingfisher. The one that just perched up on... The one that made that squawky sound. We set out one January morning to see what we could find. And soon into our hike, Major was clicking away. He spotted a green-winged teal in the river, there was also a male belted kingfisher perched on a tree and a dark eyed junco near the banks of the river. He says these are all birds that can be spotted there in the winter time. Wandering over to the other ones. So nice. Is it easier to spot animals during the winter months? Well, just for the sake that, you know, all the leaves are down. So now you can, uh, you know, you can look 
pretty far into the woods, uh, up into the trees where, where a lot of birds and, and other animals are you know, hiding out, uh, especially during the day. So let's see if I can find, there they are. You can watch the full story on watch.ripbs.org. And don't forget to tune in for new episodes of Rhode Island PBS Weekly, Sundays at 7.30 p.m. with an encore on Wednesdays. Our popular series, Treasures Inside the Museum, steps into the back rooms of museums throughout southern New England. In this fascinating episode, we visit Slater Mill to discover what makes some of the machines in their exhibit so rare, as well as to examine some of the artifacts from the 1890 Cotton Centennial. In 1789, a 21-year-old immigrant from Derbyshire, England, arrived in New York City. His goal was to convince the right people that he understood the English process for manufacturing cotton and that he could produce it here in the United States. He was invited to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and in 1793, he was the owner and operator of this building. His name was Samuel Slater, and he knew that he could build this mill using the skills of the local people and then tap the raw power of the river to power the machinery inside. So what we're looking at here is the original dam that was built by Samuel Slater and his company uh, uh, Slater, Almy and Brown. 1792, they built this dam and they built it in preparation for this mill built in 1793, the next summer. The mill and the river are two characters in this story that has been unfolding for centuries. When you visit most museums, you might see a painting hanging on a wall or an ancient artifact carefully preserved under glass. But here at Slater Mill, the artifact is the building itself. Can you imagine if you were able to walk inside of your favorite painting or look inside of your favorite artifact and see how it was made. Well, that's exactly what we get to do here. This building was constructed with an entirely new architectural style. Today we call it the corporate style of architecture. But this was the first one in America. Samuel Slater brought some design and engineering aspects of building with him to Slater Mill. And we're looking right here at one of the original beams. So this uh, oak beam, all of the vertical beams are oak and the horizontal beams are pine. And this is one of the first ones that was installed here at Slater Mill. And uh, along with it, you can notice that the edges were trimmed to get the sharp edges gone. Now that wasn't done uh, to, for any reason other than to slow the spread of fire. So in a building that is really a box, architecturally, we refer to Slater Mill as a box, uh, it's important when people are working in the middle of the box to be able to see what they're doing. So not only did they paint the walls white to help light reflect, but they added extra windows. So Slater Mill was probably the largest building in Pawtucket that people could see, and it was also remarkable that it was completely surrounded by windows, because windows are really expensive but it, the windows existed to allow light into the building so that people could see what they were doing. It was really hot in the summertime. It was probably really cold in the wintertime. They probably almost never opened or closed these windows. They were not here for ventilation. They were here for light. Watch this entire episode of Treasures Inside the Museum at watch.ripbs.org. Next, Story in the Public Square co-host G. Wayne Miller talks with science editor-in-chief Holden Thorpe about the role that science can play and should play in our lives. So Holden, I want to get back to the two camps, as it were. The one camp where people look at science and say, you know, we, we see what, you've, what has been done with research, but it's up to us to interpret and, and, and do with that what we will. And then the other camp, which says scientists have, have spoken, have proved, and now let's make it policy. How in a pluralistic society as large as the United States, with so many people, so many political factions, regions, differences by region and city and state, can those two ever be reconciled? What's the path forward with that? 
Yeah, so I think first of all is recognizing that these are the dynamics. So a lot of a lot of scientists are mystified when the public uh, as you as you said at the beginning doesn't everybody doesn't just go out and get vaccinated against covid or everybody doesn't realize that um the increase in temperature in the planet is is potentially catastrophic and we need to take collective action to stop it so job 1 is for the scientists to get their own house in order about understanding what uh is playing out here and part of the problem there is we spend too much time teaching scientists equations and didactic material about uh the different areas of science and not enough time teaching them the history of science and the sociology of of how this plays out and so science scientists have allowed themselves to get played in in getting to this point that's the first thing and then on the other side uh trying to get the people who are prior to prioritizing something else over science whether it's their religion or their ideology or their their views about um the the fun fundamentalism of the free market um to rec to admit to to state publicly that that's what they're doing because the tactic is to say no well the the science can't be trusted when what's really going on is i know the science is okay but i care more about the fact that i don't like government regulation and the only way to deal with climate change is to have government regulation and so therefore i'm going to say that the science behind climate change is wrong there's a famous story where uh Jane Lubchenco who is currently in the um Biden administration doing climate for uh, for the country uh and um uh, Mario Molina uh and Sherry Rowland who were both Nobel laureates went to see Newt Gingrich in the 90s when he was the speaker of the house to say we really need a bipartisan approach to climate change and he said okay you you seem like very smart people i understand uh what what you're trying to tell me but i can't agree with al gore so you're going to have to give me a way to help you that doesn't involve me getting on the same page as al gore well there is of such a thing okay <laughs> but you, you got to give speaker gingrich credit for at least saying this is this was the this this was his mindset and unfortunately you know scientists don't challenge the people who are doubting us in a way that gives us that kind of clarity and that's the clarity that we need tune in for story in the public square thursdays at 7:30 p.m. with an encore sunday mornings at 11 And now, here's a preview of what's coming next month on Rhode Island PBS. Part documentary film, part community builder, part fundraiser, and part day in the life scrapbook. Our town offers a collection of local legends, historical events, and personal memoirs from the tight-knit communities of Rhode Island's small towns. The latest installment of Our Town features the beautiful seaside town of Little Compton. Let's take a look. I'm Abigail Brooks. I'm the president of the Land Trust in Little Compton called Sakonic Preservation Association. And I'm standing here at the entrance to Lloyd's Beach, which marks the southernmost part of the landscape of Little Compton. This part of the coastline is extraordinarily rich with migratory and also year-round habitat. So it's been a popular place for people to fish and to bird watch and to enjoy themselves at the beach. Straight out from here, you can see two columns and a quarter column standing on the islands, and those are the remnants of a fishing club that was out there from 1865 to 1906 that hosted people like JP Morgan and President Chester A Arthur as well as other fabulously wealthy industrialists East Island which you can see as a um sort of hummock a, a granite 
hummock out there, uh, was used as uh, the kitchen garden and dairy producing uh, spot for the summer kitchen of the club. So there was a vegetable garden there, there were chickens out there, and there was a cow or two. And during bad weather, the cows needed to be brought over to the main island. So there was some tricky business going on out there. These islands are not easily accessible. There are not beaches on them. They have rocky coastlines. They're hard to get onto. You have to plan it around the tides getting onto them. So uh, it's quite miraculous, actually, that so much went on on West Island with this fishing club, considering how inaccessible and to some degree inhospitable it was. By 1906, the club closed because it just didn't have enough membership to sustain it. So it was put up for sale and one of the members bought it and held on to it through his lifetime. And when he died, he, uh, his heirs gave it to the Episcopal Diocese of Rhode Island. Then the Episcopal uh, Diocese held on to it uh, until the early 1950s and they put it up for sale. And Jesse Lloyd O'Connor, uh, the daughter of the family for which this beach is named, was worried that it might be developed again. And so she purchased it and held on to it until the early 1980s. 1983, she gave it essentially for a dollar to Sakana Preservation Association. So in 2006, we had a conservation biologist spend time on the islands documenting the, all of the plants and various uses that wildlife was putting to these two islands. So we did discover, as a result of uh, doing this baseline biological survey, that the largest population double-crested cormorants in Rhode Island is on these islands. These islands are part of a mosaic of conservation in this area that includes the uplands above this beach, which have been protected with a collaboration between the Department, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, Audubon Society, and uh, the Nature Conservancy. And these coastal areas are so important that that many organizations are willing to collaborate on working to make conservation happen here. Just by slowing down and paying attention and knowing that this conserved land and this particular area provides so much to wildlife. It just feels like a real gift. Our Town Little Compton premieres on Thursday, March 9th at 8 p.m. Watch past episodes at watch.ripbs.org. Also coming in March is our continuing series, Ocean State Sessions. Meet local musicians sharing their personal experiences and stories that inspired the creation of their work. Ocean State Sessions features performances by local musicians and brings you the stories behind the songs. This season, we're at the Narrows in Fall River. It's scary to put yourself out there fully and to just present your truth, which isn't always so pretty. It's hard to pinpoint where it comes from, you know? And if you kind of find, try to figure out where it's coming from, you might lose your way on your way to trying to figure out where it comes from. The next season of Ocean State Sessions begins March 19th. Watch full episodes on watch.ripbs.org. Last but definitely not least, Art Inc. is a Rhode Island PBS original series that explores the full possibility of the arts with fascinating stories beautifully told. In this clip, discover why some people consider insects to be nature's art. Numbering just a single group of animals, 
In this film, we shall consider what insects are and how some are injurious to man and others beneficial. Insects are the most numerous group of animals on Earth. 80% of all animals are insects. We call it nature's art. It's like a flower to someone who likes flowers. It's just beautiful. And I was actually kind of afraid of insects, but then I started working in Dr. Om's lab and I really like started falling in love with bees and butterflies and they're just really amazing. Liz has taken the pollen off of some of the bumblebees that we collected back in the early 1900s. And you can still analyze that and see what plants they were collecting that pollen from at that time. We can actually see what their preferred flowers were and we can maybe try and enhance that in the environment to bring them back to the numbers they were at one time. So this is one of our native bees. You can see that she has quite a bit of pollen on her back legs there. She was pollinating the crab apple trees here. One of my favorite thing about insects is that it's kind of like you get a little insight into a whole different universe. They're so important in food chain, other animals like birds, reptiles, amphibians. Hunting for insects and finding them is fun. Few of them will harm you, but there are many books to help you learn which ones may not be safe to handle. Watch new episodes of Art Inc. beginning Monday, March 20th at 7 p.m. Also available at ripbs.org slash artinc. Thank you for joining us this month. We'll see you next time in case you missed it.